The portion of God's word that we'll focus our hearts on on this Easter Sunday comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Can you imagine what they must have felt? 36 hours earlier, they had watched as their Lord and their master, their teacher, had been executed in the vilest manner possible. And they had stood and sadly watched from a distance as his body, which had once raised other people back to life from the dead, was laid in a tomb, lifeless. And they went home to prepare spices and perfumes in order to, to give his body a proper burial, the least and the last thing they could do for someone who had done so much for them. And then they spent what was undoubtedly a very restless Sabbath day of rest, wondering and weeping and waiting, until finally, early in the darkness on Sunday morning, they made their way to the tomb. Can you imagine what they must have been feeling in that moment? The intense, overwhelming sadness over the shocking death of someone that they loved. The, the fear and the uncertainty about what the future would hold for them now that Jesus was gone. The feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. That there was nothing they could possibly do that would make any difference now. How they must have felt so broken, so sad, so weighed down by far more than the spices and the perfumes that they carried to the tomb that morning. Can you imagine what they felt? My guess is we, we don't really have to imagine it because we've all been there. Maybe not actually walking to the tomb of our Lord, but, but maybe you know the overwhelming sadness of walking through a cemetery to the gravestone of a loved one, or walking up to the casket of your spouse, or a parent, or a child. Maybe you know that, that feeling, that suffocating grip of fear and uncertainty that grabs a hold of you of what the future might hold now as you ride in the ambulance with your spouse, or lie in a hospital bed yourself. Maybe you know the, the feelings of hopelessness and Helplessness that come, a feeling like there's nothing you can do that'll make a difference as you do battle with your, with your addictions or your depression or your mental illnesses. I'm guessing we don't have to imagine what those women were feeling on their way to the tomb because we've all been there. But when they arrived at the tomb, instantly everything changed. Because as they made it to the tomb, they realized that that tomb was open and it was empty. And as they jumped in and their hearts and their minds were racing, trying to figure out what in the world had happened to Jesus' body, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them and said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, be raised again. Suddenly, all of their fears, all of the feelings that had made it feel like they were carrying cement rather than spices, they were changed. Because the tomb was empty. Because Jesus had risen. Because Jesus was alive. And so my friends, if, if you came through the doors to Easter service this morning, labored down and bearing the weight of your fears and your failures, your hopelessness and your weaknesses, your sadness and your struggles, take heart. Because the empty tomb changes them too. Because Easter changes everything. And that's our reality in the, the right now of this life and in the not yet of the life to come because of one all-important fact. The fact that the Apostle Paul writes to the, the Corinthian Christians, because of Jesus, 
death has been swallowed up in victory. That's quite a claim, right? It's quite a claim because from the very beginning, from the day that Adam and Eve unleashed death into the world because of their sin and their rebellion against God, death has been the great consumer, the great swallower of people. Death is the greatest conqueror of conquerors, the defeater of kings and kingdoms. Death is the thief that is able to rob all of his victims of all of their earthly possessions. Death is the one inevitability of this life. And it's not as if in the two millennia since Jesus rose from the dead that death has just been held in check. I think just in the last two years, we've been receiving constant reminders from a global pandemic and mass shooting after mass shooting and now a, a war taking place in Ukraine. We've been getting constant reminders of our mortality and just how unavoidable death seems to be. So how exactly can Paul say that death has been swallowed up in victory? The reality is, even though death is still a a reality of our life in this sinful, broken world, Jesus has taken away the sting of death. Jesus has removed that which makes us afraid of dying. Like a, a rattlesnake without its fangs, like a scorpion without its tail, Jesus has removed the poison of death by his victory over death. Paul explains, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Death's power to destroy, its sting, its venom, as he says here, it's, it's sin. As Paul writes to Romans, the wages of sin is death. So like we said, death comes to life when Adam and Eve sinned against God, when they rebelled against him and brought sin into his world of perfection. See, God created all people to be perfect. He created them to live forever and never to die. And yet because of their sin, death comes into the world and death becomes the consequence for sin, physical and eternal death. And so if sin remains in our lives, if we remain in our sin, then death will always be a, a venomous snake waiting to sink its fangs into our, into our skin and inject its deadly venom through our bloodstream. And Paul says that, that the power of sin is the law. That which gives it its deadliness, that which makes it so powerful is, is the law. And when you think about it, that's true, right? If there was no law, if there was no laid out clearly, this is right and this is wrong, if God hadn't made that clear for us, then there would be no sin. And if there was no sin, then there would be no death. But the reality is God has given us his law. He has laid out for us clearly what is right and what is wrong. And every rebellion, every failure that we have to keep that law, that's the power of sin that leads to death. And so because we are sinners and because we sin, that means that the venom of sin sinks through our bodies and, and we are going to die because of sin. Now, that really helps us to understand ourselves, doesn't it? Because it's not like death is this unavoidable thing because, well, we just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, so tough luck, we end up dying. No, death is unavoidable because we're sinners. Death is unavoidable because regularly and willingly and sometimes even joyfully, we have injected the venom of sin into our lives. And so if our sin goes unchecked, if our sin remains in us, it's going to kill us. Sinners will die. Now, it certainly doesn't stop people from doing everything they can to try and stave off death, does it? From the normal everyday things, right, your diet and your exercise, from normal health procedures and things like that that can take place, medication and supplements, all the way up to the really extreme things like cryogenic freezing, where they take your head after you die and they freeze it, assuming that someday science is going to be able to make mankind immortal, and then they'll thaw you out and bring you back to life and you'll live forever. Whether it's the normal everyday stuff or the extreme stuff, the fact is we as human beings are always looking for ways to not 
die. But although some of those things, they might allow us to live a little longer, none of them can keep us from dying. None of them will make us live forever because they're all temporary. And it doesn't matter what religious leader or what philosopher or what talking head you subscribe to and follow. The fact is none of them can make you live forever either because they're all dead too or will die someday. See, there's no one or there's no thing in this world that can make you live forever. There's nothing that can save you from death because every solution that this world has for death, it's temporary. Except for one. There is only one who can save you from death because there is only one who has swallowed up death in victory. As Paul writes, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus has won the victory over death. Because he has conquered the sting of sin and he's conquered the power of the law. He's kept them. As Hebrews says, Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus subdued the power of the law by keeping the law perfectly. Jesus serves as the antidote for the venom of sin by never sinning, by never having sin in his life. And so through his perfect life, and the death that he dies to pay for our sin, Jesus has finished the work of salvation. He has won eternal life that doesn't end for you through his life and through his death. And so Easter changes everything. Because what happens on Good Friday and what happens on Easter Sunday means that Jesus has won a total victory over death. And Jesus' resurrection is the assurance that Jesus meant what he said from the cross on Good Friday. Through his life and through his death, then it's absolutely true what Jesus said. It is finished. Everything that was required, every payment that needed to be made, it has been finished in Jesus. And the assurance of the resurrection shows us that truth, that it is finished. And that's why Jesus walked out of that tomb alive. And so Easter changes the way we view things like sin and guilt and shame. Because Jesus walked out of the tomb, that means that it is finished. And Easter changes the way that we think about death. Now, a a rattlesnake by itself, right, is a pretty intimidating, pretty scary thing by its looks and by its sounds. And if it lunges at you, you're probably going to scream, you're probably going to run away as fast as you can. But if that rattlesnake has had its fangs removed, if those fangs that it uses to inject its venom into your body are gone, what harm can that rattlesnake do to you? What's it going to do? Gum you to death? In the same way, if Jesus has removed the sting of death, if he's taken away that which puts its venom into our lives by taking away sin and conquering death, that means that we as followers of Jesus... We who put our trust and our faith in him, we've got nothing to worry about when it comes to death. You have no reason to be afraid of death. Because if Jesus has taken away its venom and its sting, what can death do to you? The truth is, the interesting twist, because Jesus has swallowed up death and victory, like if you swallow something, it becomes part of you, Because Jesus has swallowed up death in victory, that means that now God can use something like death and use it as a tool for victory. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? That that which was our greatest enemy, that which was overhanging us at all times and leading us to live in fear, God can take that and twist it around and use it for something that gives us ultimate victory. You see, Easter changes everything. Because Easter makes our death simply the gateway to eternal life. Easter changes everything. And the reality is, if Jesus is able to conquer death, the one unavoidable, inevitable aspect of our lives that we can do nothing to stop, if Jesus can conquer that, 
then what can happen in your life that he can't conquer? What can happen in your life that he already hasn't conquered? Easter changes everything. See, Martin Luther once wrote, I have no fear of death. I have no more fear of death than taking off an old garment and casting it away to put on a new beautiful garment of immortality and incorruptibility, spun and woven by Christ's victory. I don't know about you, but I've never been terrified to take off my dirty, wet, sweaty, smelly clothes after I mow the lawn in the hot Florida summer so that I can put on some clean, fresh clothes that are dry and smell nice. We're not afraid of that, right? We look forward to it. And what a garment we get to look forward to putting on. And that's what death is for the Christian. Taking off our dirty, nasty, soiled, sinful garment and throwing it away forever and putting on a garment that's been spun by Jesus' victory. A garment that is incorruptible and immortal. See, Easter changes everything, including us. As Paul says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. See, Jesus' resurrection guarantees us that one day we also are going to rise from the dead. So Easter changes everything, including our physical bodies. See, at the last day, Jesus is going to come back again, and he's going to raise back to life all those who have died. But not like zombies, not like rotting corpses and skeletons walking around. No, he says we will all be changed. Even those who are still alive when Jesus returns, those who haven't died yet, we will be changed. And what does that change look like? Paul writes to the Philippians, Jesus will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What exactly does that look like? To have a glorious, glorified body, what does that mean? It means that like Jesus, our bodies are going to be made perfect. And think about the implications of that. If your body is made perfect, it means that all of the consequences, all of the fallout that comes upon our physical bodies because of sin, it's gone. We're set free from it. Set free from disease and deformity and deficiency. Set free from pain and suffering and struggle. Set free from addiction or depression or temptation. Set free from death. Set free from our guilt and shame over the sinful things that we've used our bodies to do. Set free from the, the scars and the shame of what others have sinfully done to our bodies. What is left is perfection. What is left is what God intended mankind's body to be from the very beginning when he made it in perfection. What is left is a return to Eden. A return to Eden that will never decay and never die and never end. I'm looking forward to that. Now, that inevitably leads to the, the, the next questions. What does that look like, right? How old are we going to be in that glorified body? What am I going to look like when a, a baby dies and goes to heaven? When they get their body back, are they still going to be a baby or are they going to be an adult? Will old people look like they're in their 40s or in their 30s? And these are the questions that we ask, right? And here's the answer to all those questions. It's like holding other people's babies. Now, let me explain what I mean. When you don't have any children of your own, it's a lot of fun to hold other people's babies, isn't it? Now, you get to hold them, and they're cute, and, and it's fun to think about the future and maybe what it's going to be like someday if God blesses you with children of your own. And if they start crying or they fill their diaper, you can hand them back off again. See, when you hold other people's babies but you don't have any of your own, it, it's fun to think about what it might be like someday. But you really can't experience what it's like. You really don't know what it's like until 
the doctor places your own child into your arms for the first time. You can't really know what it's like in, until you just experience it for yourself. And the same thing is true with our perfect, glorified, glorious bodies. We're not going to know what it's like until we experience it for ourselves. That's a lot of fun to think about, isn't it? And you can look ahead to that with eager anticipation, with confident expectation. You can look forward to that knowing with absolute confidence that you will have that perfect glorified body because Jesus has won the victory over death. Because Jesus has won for you eternal life. Because Easter changes everything. Imagine how they must have felt. The women. But not as they were making their way to the tomb. Imagine how they felt on the day when they, they closed their eyes on earth and woke up in heaven. Imagine how they felt to stand face to face with the, the risen Savior that they didn't find on that first Easter Sunday, but then they found him there forever as he welcomed them home with open arms. Think of how they felt. That is, your, your loved ones who have fallen asleep in Christ. When they fell asleep on earth and, and woke up face to face with their Savior. Friends, that's victory. The feeling of victory that they now experience and that never ends for all eternity. That's the same feeling of victory that you and I can have today and every day until we join them forever because every day is a day of victory. Because the victory is not yours. It's his. His victory is your victory and that victory does not change. So friends, let every day be a day of Easter joy. Let every day be a day of Easter victory because death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.